This video was sponsored by Deal Dash. Hey, in this video, I'm going to show you how I built these outdoor patio chairs. And there's plans available. And if you're a patron, you get the plans for free. So if you're not a patron, make sure you check out the link in the video description and sign up. You also get a bunch of behind the scenes footage, live weekly question and answers, and a whole bunch of other things. But before we get into this build, let me start with a story of how I came to build these in the first place. So I was taking my normal lunch break, making my favorite snack of cereal. Well, cereal and a little liquid encouragement. But hey, that's how I always eat it. I grab my bowl, I grab my spoon, and I headed outside to have a nice bowl of cereal by the fire. That's when Craig ran up behind me and kicked the leg out from under my chair. Dude, that was my only good chair. So being down one chair and one bowl of perfectly good cereal, I got online to see if I could buy some better quality outdoor patio chairs. I went to this big box website and they were selling these nice wooden chairs. There was just one problem. $719? On sale? <laughs> yeah, that's ridiculous. That's when I decided to see if perhaps I could make these myself and save a little money. So I ripped off the design completely from that website and redesigned it in SketchUp. I think I got it pretty darn close to the original design. Now we're gonna try and answer the question of whether or not it's cheaper to build something yourself or cheaper to just buy it. So I headed to the Hardwood Center, my local hardwood supplier, and I found some nice 8 quarter sapili. I also found some three-quarter sapili, and I figured between those two, I could make two awesome chairs. While I was there, I also snuck behind the counter when nobody was looking, because that's where they hide the good candy. As if the customers don't want good candy, too. Just put it out for everyone. Jeez. So with candy in hand and our bill paid, we loaded up our sapile into the back of my truck, and we headed home to start ripping off some chair designs from some fancy schmancy website. The first thing I needed to do was take these long boards and rough cut them to length. That'll make it way easier to mill them up and get them square. Nobody wants to wrestle super long boards through your joiner or planer. So I just chopped them up into a bunch of manageable bite-sized pieces and I did my normal milling routine. First I ran them through the joiner to get one perfectly square and straight edge after they were nice and square on one side, I went over to the table saw and I ripped them down to the correct width. I don't know if it's like this in the actual design, but for my design, I made all the pieces just four inches. I figured that was nice and easy. After ripping down all my pieces to four inches, I went back over to the joiner and I ran them through this time on the face to get a nice square face and a reference surface so that I could run them through the planer. And then I took all of my pieces, and there were a lot of them, and I ran them through the planer. Over and over and over again, until I brought them down to just about an inch and a half. Maybe a little over. Whew. That was a lot of milling. And just when I thought all my milling was done, I remembered, oh yeah, the eight quarter was only the frame of the chairs. I still got to do all the three quarter for the slats. Starting to wonder if I should have just bought those chairs online. So I did the same routine with my three-quarter stock. Only this time, I just edge-jointed it and then cut it to width. I mean, it was already surfaced on both sides, so I figured that's good enough for slats. Then I went over to my SketchUp drawing. I figured out how long each one of those slats needed to be, right at 21 inches. And I set a stop block on my miter saw fence and I went to town cutting piece after piece after piece until I had enough slats for two beautiful 
outdoor patio chairs. With all my slats cut to length, I could finally start laying out and cutting the individual pieces for my seat frame. Now, because I just made up all these angles on SketchUp, I didn't know exactly what they were. And sure, there's a way to figure out the exact angle in SketchUp, but there's also a really easy way just to draw it out on your piece of wood. Basically, I isolate each individual piece in the SketchUp drawing, and I turn it back into a square. Then all I have to do is measure over from the edge of that square on two points, one on the top and the bottom, and I connect the dots. This gives me my exact angle. Seems simple because it is, and you don't have to do any math, which I like. You just gotta draw lines, and I'm pretty good at that. With our lines drawn, you just take it over to the miter saw, you set your angle to match that line, and you cut it. Now because we're not cutting the length yet, I just take all my pieces, and I cut that same angle on the end of each one. Once I have the angle cut on the end of each piece, then I flip my first piece over, change my angle on my miter saw to match that new line, and I cut this one. Now this does cut our piece to length. So after cutting this piece to length, I then set up a stop block, and I use that stop block as a reference to cut all three of my remaining pieces to that identical shape and angle. Just like this. Zip, zap, now these are just one of the multiple pieces that it'll take to make up our seat frame. So with those four first pieces cut, I go back over to my SketchUp drawing and I pick out a new piece. This time I'm going to cut these little guys. And I'll show you a little bit more what I mean by making it into a square. So I'm just going to take this little pencil tool here. I'm going to draw a line down here and then... I don't know how you unclick the pencil thing. I'm sure there's probably a quicker way. I'm gonna square off the bottom there and click that thing. Square off the top here. Okay, one more line and connect the dots. Now, instead of the angles, it's back into just a rectangle. So I just have to measure over and down on the top and bottom, transfer those measurements onto my square piece and connect the dots to get my angle. See? Not too hard. Now I will mention that I did make plans which are available on my website, so you don't have to do any of this. The angles are right there on the plan, so you can just look at the angle, set your miter saw, and cut it. It will be much easier on you, but I'm showing you this process in case you ever want to design something yourself and, like me, want to avoid math at all costs. Which you should, because math is dumb. Unless you're a kid and you're watching this, kids, math is important, and you should know it. So do your homework, or just buy a calculator. Either way, I set my miter saw to those angles, I cut out all my pieces with the stop block, and now I had two of my three pieces for the lower part of my seat frame. Now my third piece is a little trickier, because although it's got a pretty simple angle on one end that I could easily cut on the miter saw, the other angle is this. This really steep angle that I could not cut on the miter saw. So if you ever need to cut a steep angle, I'm gonna show you a really quick way to make what I like to call a poor man's tapering jig. You're gonna start by just taking a big piece of plywood and run it through your table saw. Get a nice clean edge on one side. Then you're gonna leave your table saw fence right where it is, don't touch it. And you're gonna take your piece that you need to cut your steep angle on and you're gonna just stick on a piece of double-sided tape. This is just double-sided carpet tape. It works really well to stick two pieces of wood together. Once you have your double-sided tape on there, you're gonna take your piece of plywood and you're gonna stick it right on that line of the angle you need to cut. So the edge is right on your pencil line. Then you're gonna press it down, activating that double-sided tape, just like this. And then all you really have to do at this point is run that piece of plywood back through the table saw and cut your angle. It's really not hard and it's a great way to cut steep angles without having to go through the effort of chalking it up into a tapering jig. Unless you have a tapering jig, well then just throw it in there. But I wanted to show you this way because it's easy and we like easy. Now if we got all of our angles correct, all three of these pieces should fit together to make this nice triangular shape that will be the lower section 
of our chair frame assembly. And what do you know? They all fit together just how they should. Now I could have used that same quick tapering jig method to cut my other three pieces, but it can be hard to get it duplicated that way. So because I already had one piece exactly the way I wanted it, I decided just to go ahead and use that piece as a router template. So I put some more double-sided tape on my newly cut piece and I taped my other pieces to it. This will give me a perfect template that I can then take over to the router table and using a flush trim pattern bit, I just cut my other piece to match my first piece. Now I did trim off a little bit on the bandsaw first so I didn't have to take so much off with the router, but you get the idea. I just repeated this step three times and I had identical pieces. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Then after I got all my pieces cut, all I had to do was pry them apart and peel the tape off. And as you will see, all these pieces are identical. Well, they're actually kind of not, they're like snowflakes. No two pieces of wood are exactly the same, but they're the same shape at least. Next, I need to do these upper riser portions. This is gonna make the back of our seat. And as you can see, when I separate these two pieces, I have them half lapped. So this back piece will half lap into that lower piece to make a nice strong joint. I wanted to try and make a chair that will hurt Craig if he tries to kick it and break it rather than making me fall out of it. So using the measurements from my SketchUp drawing, you can use the measurements from the plans on my website. I marked out exactly where I needed the half lap to go on my lower frame piece. I just drew a line for my angle and then I used one of my other pieces that are four inches to set my width. Plopped it on there, traced a line, and now we know exactly where we need to cut halfway through our side portion. Now because the back is angled, I have to cut these half laps at an angle, which is really easy on my Rockler crosscut sled because I can adjust the angle. Well, it's really easy for two of the cuts. You see the angle is going to be the opposite on the other two pieces, but we'll get to that here in just a second. I start out by setting up a stop block so that I can get both my cuts identical and I run each piece through one time. After I have that distance set, I remove the stop block and then I just keep going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, kind of like this. See? Back and forth. And I just keep testing a little bit here, a little bit there until I get a nice snug fit, just like that. And then I just repeat this process again on the other piece, going back and forth, hogging out a bunch. As you can see, I have a little pencil mark on the far right there so I don't go too far. When I get close to that line, I slow down my passes and just take a little bit off at a time checking it with a little scrap piece every time to make sure that I get a nice tight fit with my half lap until yeah looks like that snug that's what you want like a bug in a rug sorry couldn't help myself now my other two pieces are a little more difficult because the angle is going the opposite way and my crosscut sled doesn't have adjustability for doing the angle in that direction but here's a little trick that will allow you to cut any angle you want on any crosscut sled, regardless of whether or not you can adjust the angle. All you gotta do is find the angle of your piece and set it on your crosscut sled. I know that I need to cut my piece at the angle in which it is oriented right now. Then you just take a wedge with the pointy side down and put some double-sided tape on the flat side and slowly slide it in between your piece and your fence until the point makes contact with the fence and the flat surface makes contact with your piece and stick it on there. Now we've got two points of reference along our fence, one at the base of that wedge and the other one at the far end of our actual piece. So as we slide this piece back and forth across our fence, it's gonna act essentially the exact same way as if our fence was angled itself, only it's not. Our piece is just angled. So we can cut any angle we want in the opposite direction without very much effort. So with my angle set, I do the exact same thing I did to the first two pieces with my newly angled crosscut sled invention 
thingamabob. Anyways, in no time I have both the half laps cut for both sides of my chairs. You see this half lap is facing in and looks like this. And then my other half lap, well, it's just a mirrored image on the other side facing the other half lap. So that's what that looks like in case you were wondering. Next, we just need to cut half laps on our seat back pieces, but we'll get to that in just a second. Oh, hey, this video is sponsored by Deal Dash. I'm actually deal dashing right now. And if you're wondering, what the heck's Deal Dash? Well, it's an online auction site. It's been operating for over 10 years. They have great deals every day, and it's a ton of fun. Basically, it's a pay to play auction site. So you buy bids, they got a zillion amazing deals. Right now, I'm trying to bid on a $100 Bass Pro Shop gift card. And the current bid is only $3.34. So I'm locked in this thing trying to win. It's actually a pretty cool setup because you can bid in real time or you can enter a block of bids and it'll just keep re upping your bid every time you're next in line. And each bid is only one cent. Every auction starts at zero dollars. It gets raised by one cent. There's a countdown timer. So 10 seconds, other people have the bid. And if nobody bids in that 10 seconds, then you win whatever you're bidding for. It's actually kind of addicting. And I'm sorry, I'm just locked in trying to win this Bass Pro card. So the way this works is that lots of companies, they'll buy excess of products and they can't move them all. So Deal Dash will buy all that excess stuff at super cheap and then they'll pass the savings on to you. So there's been people on here that have gotten a PS5 for like 50 cents. Yeah, that's crazy. There's new deals every day. There's a ton of promotions. You can buy bid packages so that you have a big chunk of bids to play with. Shipping is always free on Deal Dash. You get a 90 day money back guarantee on your first bid package. And the really cool thing is that if you get tired of waiting on your bids, you can just click buy it now and it's still a great deal. So if you love great deals, head to the link in my description to try Deal Dash for yourself and use the coupon code bourbon to get 100 free bids with your first purchase. And then you can be on your phone like me trying to win a gift card. It's up to $3.70. I'm gonna get this $100 gift card for like four bucks, I know it. All right, now we gotta cut the half laps on our seat back pieces. I'm sure these have some weird technical term that chair makers would know, but I am not one of those people that knows such things. So I'm gonna call it my seat back pieces. So I take my other half lap, I lay it over the top, and I make sure there's just a little bit hanging out the bottom. Then using an X-Acto knife, I cut a nice straight line right where I need to start my half lap cut. And I mark it on either side of the piece so that I can reference that line over on my crosscut sled. Then using my same little wedge technique to get my angle right, I just run it back and forth, but this time I go all the way down the piece not worrying about where I finish, just where I start. Like I said, this lap is gonna hang out the bottom and that is okay. Once I cut the lap, I take it over and I test my fit. And what do you know? It fits just like I want it, with just a little bit hanging out the bottom that we will clean up later after we glue these things together. Next, I needed to cut my chair back thingamawetsits to length, and I wanted that cut to be parallel to the ground. So I just took a long ruler, I marked my height on one side, and I marked my height on the other side. And once I had both of those marks, I just connected the dots. I feel like that's a common theme in this whole build. Making marks and connecting the dots. Cha-cha-cha. With that line drawn, all we have to do is go find that angle on the miter saw and cut it to length. Then we're gonna cut all the pieces at that exact same angle. With all those pieces cut, we can finally glue these laps together. Now because these are outdoor chairs, I'm going to be using thickened epoxy to glue everything up. That way it's not going to break apart when it gets wet. Not that these chairs are really going to get wet, they're going to be under a deck so they'll never get any direct water. But they will still get more moisture than an indoor chair, so Total Boat thickened epoxy seemed like the way to go. So after smearing a liberal amount in between my lap, I pound them together. And I pound them a little more. 
and then just throw on a few clamps and set aside and wait for that thickened epoxy to dry. Now this is their quick cure thickened epoxy, so it only takes about two hours to completely set up, which I like because other epoxy can take like eight hours and ain't nobody got time for that. In no time, I had all four of my side back component pieces glued up. And later that evening, after waiting the required two hours, I came back out and removed the clamps and set to getting all of these half laps trimmed up. Well, first I'm gonna show you a nice montage of me taking clamps off and stacking them up because I'm a YouTuber. And without beautiful montages of me doing pointless things that you don't need to see, well, what kind of YouTube video is this? To clean up my half laps, I went back over to the router table and again just using that flush trim pattern routing bit, up cut, down cut, I don't know what it's called, but you can get it at bitsbits.com. This is probably one of my most used bits in my arsenal, so it's definitely a good one to have. As you can see, it makes quick work of that end grain and everything is cut flush and looking clean. Ooh, nice. And with that, we have all of the pieces cut to size and shape for our entire chair. Next, we just have to figure out how we're gonna hook them all together. For that, we are going to be using dominoes. Now, don't hate me. If you don't have a domino joiner, you could do this exact same thing with the doweling jig. It would just take a lot longer. So, I don't wanna use a doweling jig because I have a domino joiner. So, I'm gonna use that. So I started clamping all of my slats in place using a one inch setup block to keep everything spaced nice and even. Now there are other ways to do this so you don't have to clamp it all up, but I like to clamp everything up the way I want it oriented. That way I know if there's anything I didn't think about ahead of time. I like to see it in place before I actually hook it together forever. Like this end piece. I almost forgot that we had to cut this at an angle because the front is angled. So after getting this piece of eight quarter clamped between my two outer pieces, I took a pencil, marked the angle, and I went over to the table saw. I'll also mention that I might have forgot to turn my dust extractor on, hence the giant cloud of sapili that is now in my lungs. With that, I switched to the back slats getting those all clamped in place. And once everything was clamped in, I could start marking out for all of my domino joinery. My plan was to put two dominoes on each side per slat. That should be enough to hold this thing together for the rest of Earth's existence. And then I started the long and tedious journey of drilling out all the mortises for about 60 or so dominoes per chair. That's one slat. I dominoed and dominoed and dominoed some more. And approximately 65 years later, I had everything mortised out and I was almost ready to start hooking these chairs together. But not quite ready yet. Because I completely forgot about the other dominoes that I had to add. And that was for the entire base assembly. Just when you think you're done, they pull you back in. So I marked out where all those dominoes needed to land and I drilled some more mortises with my domino joiner. Yes, making sure to use my patented hip thrust technique the entire time. You can laugh at me all you want, but if you wanna keep two hands on the machine, the hip thrust is the only way to get the job done. With all of those mortises drilled out, I added a few dominoes and I put everything together for a nice dry fit. And once I got it together, this is when I made a design decision. You see, all my joints were nice and tight and somewhat seamless, but I knew they weren't gonna stay that way. As soon as I put this thing outside and the weather gets to it and things start moving around, there's a chance that a few of those joints are gonna open up. So I decided instead of trying to make those joints perfect that I would draw attention to them and make them more of a feature. 
so I took all my pieces apart and decided to add a 8 inch round over to absolutely every single edge on all of these pieces before I joined them together. Now you might think I'm crazy because this goes against everything that you're taught in normal furniture making. You don't want an 8 inch round over right where two pieces of wood come together, but I thought it might look kind of cool and it did. It essentially added a nice shadow line to each joint and I think it's going to look a lot better in the long run done this way. So I grabbed all my pieces, I grabbed my round over bit, and I went to town. Zip. Zap. Wait for it. Zoop. And with all my pieces rounded over I could finally start gluing everything together. Again to glue this up I'm using Total Boat's Thickened Epoxy. I switched to the tube this time because I just thought it would be easier to apply. So I just squeezed a little on every domino, smeared it around, and inserted them. I'm only putting the Thixo on the dominoes themselves because I'm trying to avoid squeeze out at all cost. Especially now that I rounded over all of those seams, I don't want to fill them up again with squeezed out thickened epoxy. So less is more. Just let those domino tenons do their job. To clamp everything up, because they were at some pretty extreme angles, I just took a few of the offcuts from my miter saw station, from my previous cutting endeavors, and I used them as little clamping calls to allow me to get clamps on nice square surfaces that were perfectly parallel to one another. Then with all of the frame pieces glued up for my seats, I just set them aside and waited until they were dry. And because this is a YouTube video, they're dry. So I took off all the clamps and now we could start working on getting all of our slats glued in place. And yes, I am kind of dreading this part because there are a lot of dominoes and all of them need to be slathered with a lot of total boat thickened epoxy. So instead of doing them individually, one by one, like a silly willy, I just made a big pile of them. Then I squirted some total boat all over the top, like your favorite choice salad dressing. And like a salad, I just mixed those greens up until all of them were thoroughly coated in a nice goopy layer of thickened epoxy. Ooh yeah, just really get in there, work that stuff together, make sure it's nice and evenly spread around. And then I took all of those goopy dominoes and inserted them into my pre-drilled mortises, just like this. As you can see, there's a larger slot at the front of the chair. That's because I wasn't sure on the height of that front piece and I wanted to be able to wiggle it around a little bit, just in case you were wondering why that big slot was there. Maybe you weren't, but I figured I'd let you know, just in case. With all my dominoes in place, I very carefully lowered my side piece onto the top. And this is when I thought maybe it would have been easier if I put the dominoes in the side piece and lowered it down rather than the dominoes in the slat. I got it done in the end, but I probably should have done it the other way. A little tap, tap, boom, tap, tap, bang, and my chair was put together. And, well, it looks pretty much like it did on that fancy website. Take that, Crate and Barrel 2. Not that that's the site I was looking at, I just... Okay, that was the site I was looking at. So with one chair completely glued up, I threw some clamps on there to hold it secure until that epoxy dried, and then, yeah, I had to do the exact same thing on the other chair. But as you can see, this time I put the dominoes in both side pieces, so that when I set the side piece on the top, it actually wasn't any easier than doing it the other way. It was still a pain, but like the other one, I got it together in the end, and this time I opted for these Rockler squeeze clamps, which worked very well. I just didn't quite have enough to do the entire chair. The next morning I came out and removed all of the clamps, 
And I was so close to being done with these things. There were just a few more little touches that needed to be done to put the Dunzo stamp on this. Step number one, I sanded everything down thoroughly to get rid of all of my pencil marks that were left behind from marking out the dominoes. As well as getting rid of any epoxy prints. That's what I call fingerprints left behind when you have goopy epoxy hands. With them all sanded down, I wanted to sit in them. I mean, I had yet to do that and I wanted to see if they were actually comfortable. So I set it on the floor, I sat down, and um, oh wait a second, I'm forgetting a key part to these chairs. I got on Amazon and bought these outdoor patio cushions so that they were just like the ones on the internet. And yes, there is a link for these cushions in the video description. And they were darn comfortable. And now is where I will tell you that if I were to buy these chairs online, it would have cost $720 per chair. That is $1,440. And all of my materials, including the cushions, cost me just under $700. And that's for two chairs. So I basically built two chairs for the price of one if I had ordered them online. Now, I did spend hours building them, so you have to take that into account. And I do have tens of thousands of dollars worth of specialty woodworking equipment in my shop. So yes, that is a valid point. But the real point is I built them for half the price. So just, just let me have this, okay? The very last thing I did was add these little stainless steel feet to the bottom of each chair. This is just to raise them up off the ground so that they're never sitting in direct water. This will just help keep them looking beautiful for a long time. And because this is Sapile, I'm not even going to put finish on them. I'm just going to set them outside, let nature do its thing, and eventually they will turn gray and look nice and weathered while still staying very strong and secure. There was just one thing left to do. Haul them out by the fireside and sit down and have a nice relaxing dram of whiskey to celebrate a successful build. And this time, if Craig tries to interrupt my peaceful afternoon, hopefully he'll have a broken toe and I'll have a dry outfit. <laughs>